Like I was introduced, my name is Dr. Mike Perlman. Um, my background is I'm actually a Colorado native who did both undergraduate and medical school here at the University of Colorado. Um, and then I did my postgraduate training all in Houston at the University of Texas, whether it was the University of Texas School of Medicine or the University of Texas MD Anderson, where I did uh, residency in pediatric neurology and then I did a PhD in cancer pharmacology, followed by two fellowships in bachelor fellowships. Uh, one fellowship in neuro-oncology and one fellowship in stage four, which is phase one oncology. Okay, so I want to introduce a small case to you. A 45-year-old man comes into the ER and he's complaining of headaches, but they're not rebound headaches. And so uh, an imaging is, is obtained of the brain and there's this large mass right here. So that is not due to medication overuse. So, typically, if anybody saw this movie, it was called Kindergarten Carl, and a bunch of kids are in the classroom, and Arnold is sitting there, and he's like, oh my god, I don't know if I can handle teaching a whole kindergarten class. And one kid says, oh, I think it's a tumor, and he's like, it's not a tumor. <laughs> so, unfortunately, in this case, it is. So, the incidence of primary brain tumors are about 70,000 new cases per year. Of that, 25,000 of those generally are considered to be primary malignant brain tumors. And of those, about 13,000, 14,000 patients die of a malignant brain tumor per year. Um, we don't know the cause. Uh, historically, people are like, well, is it cell phones? Is it saccharin? Is it any sort of other radiation? There's never been any, any evidence to say, yes, this is the cause, and no, this is the cause. We really don't know what causes these brain tumors. Um, typically, the presentation is a headache. A uh, patient comes in with a horrible, horrible headache to the ER, as 90% of the time going to the ER, and they get imaging, like the first case said, and it's discovered it's a brain tumor. Seizure is the second most presenting uh, issue that you can see. Other issues are confusion and obviously uh, mental, uh, other mental problems. Um, so typically, how are these diagnosed? Diagnosed through imaging. Uh, imaging, whether it's a CT scan first or an MRI, um, usually a mass is identified and then the patient is uh, referred to neurosurgery and neurosurgery goes in and either does a biopsy or a resection. So in this case, again, Arnold was wrong. Um, so an example of a presentation <laughs> is uh, this. This is the difference between a higher grade tumor and a, this is the higher grade tumor and this is the uh, grade three tumor which is still um, a malignant tumor. So how do we grade these? We grade these on a scale of one to four, grade one through four. It's not the same as other cancer where it's stage one through four. Grading is in brain tumors, it is purely based on how aggressive the tumor is. The four is the worst, the one is the least, um, and this is the way we've historically graded brain tumors. That convention is changing. So here, these are examples of um, a certain cell line called an astrocytoma, and here, it's going to be easier if I do this. There. No, not easier. So here, this is a grade one, and that's typically called a pilocytic astrocytoma that happens in kids. Then in more adults, you get, see grade twos, grade threes, and grade fours. Grade fours are lethal. Uh, grade twos tend to progress into grade fours over time. So this is a um, diagnosis that most people don't want. Uh, again, the overall survival, if you have a low grade tumor, like a grade two, the overall survival is about 120 months to 10 years. And that goes down to a grade 4, which a GBM, which is less than 16 months historically. Uh, this is examples of what tumors look like. And this slide is important here. I don't know if everybody can see that. So here, the lower right corner uh, basically is an example of histology. You take the tumor, you give it to the pathologist, the pathologist looks at it, slices it really thin, and sees, sees things, and sees things that indicate it's a high-grade tumor, meaning you see a lot of cells growing, you see necrotic tissue, and you see blood vessels growing. That historically is how we've done it. And as you can imagine, that's really not the whole picture. So um, the things that we take into, the indication, into consideration 
um, is tumor grade, but we also look at age, functional status, how much of the resection was accomplished. So what we consider is if the tumor is 95% or, or greater removed, that is a good prognosis or a better prognosis uh, than leaving less than that. So there's been plenty of articles uh, over the years that have demonstrated that the more you get, but specifically 95% or greater, the better the outcome. So tumor location is always an issue if the tumor is not resectable. Um, so historically what we've thought is this, is that there's two pathways to get to a, a GBM. There's either one, one pathway that patients just identified with the GBM and we assume that maybe it was just popped up and started as a GBM. Or alternatively, on the far left hand side, is uh, it starts out as a lower grade and becomes a higher grade. And these are all based on mutations. So, um, there it is, based on mutations. So, that brings me up to the next point, is that, like I said, historically, tumors were thought to be diagnosed based on what the slide looked like. That is not the case anymore. Um, so basically, everything is translated in the oncology world to a molecular profile. Recently, there was a study. There was actually two studies done simultaneously. One was done by Mayo and UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, and one was by, uh, done by a project called the Cancer Genome Atlas. Both, both took a number of patients, about 500 each. They looked at each molecular mutation that they tested for, the uh, panel was probably somewhere between three and 500 oncogenes, and they found out that actually you can determine prognosis based on the molecular mutations a lot better than you can by looking at, under a slide. And so what they determined was the slide is a very, it's a part of the picture, but it's really not the significant part of the picture. And it's like you have two Corvettes, one from New York and one from Houston. And they're both red, they're both 2002, but the wear and tear that each of those two red cor Corvettes have gone under is, is, is very different given their location, during their environmental exposures. So if you open those hood, one of those cars has a problem with the carburetor, one of those par cars has a problem with the alternator. So you can think of it on that level. So the problems that we've identified are three different markers. One is called IDH1, one is called TERT, and one is called 1P19Q. IDH1 and 1P19Q have been used for years in terms of figuring out is this a more aggressive tumor versus maybe not as an aggressive tumor. Um, but TERT is something uh, that has been newly introduced. So the combination of those three markers basically tell us uh, this is more aggressive. So what we've done in the past is we've looked at the MRI, we've said this looks like a low grade tumor because on MRI there's no enhancement. That's not true anymore because there's plenty of low grade tumors that act as aggressively as a grade 4 GBM. So what we've been able to determine here, and this is basically a stratification of how looking at a molecular biomarker panel works, is that here you have triple positive. Uh, and triple positive is much better than triple negative. It's much like breast cancer. So triple positive probably means you're going to live longer than the average person. Triple negative probably means that you're going to live less than the average person. You can have a TERT mutation in a low-grade tumor, and that tells us that it's going to behave like an aggressive glioblastoma. And the reverse is true as well, is that sometimes you have patients who have a glioblastoma whose average life expectancy, you tell them, is about 16 months and then all of a sudden they're living five years. Why is that? The reason is they have a different uh, molecular pain. So, let's see. How do I start this? Oh, there it is, I got it. Foundation Medicine. So I wanted to demonstrate this video. Patients with a powerful new weapon in the fight against cancer. Advanced genomic sequencing, plus an interpretive report that matches DNA mutations in a tumor with targeted therapies. So I'm about to introduce, introduce this video to you because what I wanted to discuss is how do we go about testing tumors. And we generally use uh, various different panels. The one I use most often, which I use all the time at MD Anderson, was Foundation One. But there are other panels out there. 
The difference about Foundation One for me is I, I like basically what they're about to talk about. I like not only their ability to do next generation sequencing on a large number of oncogenes, but also on the fact that their reports help me by telling me uh, basically how to treat. So I'll play the rest of this video. We call it Foundation One. Imagine if a tumor could talk and reveal information about how to treat it. Foundation One decodes that information to give patients personalized treatment options. The first generation of genetic tests for cancer are designed to find one or just a few genomic alterations. But these tests aren't comprehensive, and with limited tissue available, how do doctors decide which tests to run? Foundation One is different. It's a single genomic test for all types of solid tumors that finds clinically relevant DNA alterations in the tumor that may contribute to its growth. Because it efficiently captures more information in one test, Foundation One helps physicians identify targeted treatments that may be more effective, less toxic, and may not have been considered yet. Ordering Foundation One is simple. The physician checks one box, and Foundation Medicine contacts pathology to obtain a routine tissue sample. In our lab, we extract DNA and capture only those genes known to be associated with cancer. Then we sequence those captured genes to reveal the information that may influence treatment decisions. Next, we prepare an easy-to-read interpretive report that matches the test results with available therapies and open clinical trials. Either as a paper report or via our secure online portal, Foundation One provides clear, actionable information and treatment options based on the latest science. Everything in the report summary is supported by peer-reviewed research, and as knowledge grows, our test will expand, and our report will offer new insights, keeping doctors up on the latest therapeutic options. Simply put, it's like having a team of the world's foremost cancer experts working for every patient. A precise genomic tumor blueprint, together with research that helps personalize each patient's treatment options. That's Foundation One. So, that brings me to, okay, historically, how have these tumors been treated? Up until 2005, there was a cocktail of three old-time chemotherapeutic agents used. Uh, the acronym is PCV, horribly toxic and ineffective. So in 2005, a drug named Timidar was, was shepherded in uh, after about 10 years of clinical trials, both in Europe and the United States, and it was found to be every bit as effective, if not more effective, than that chemotherapeutic regimen, but without the toxicity. And it basically expanded life expectancy from 9 to 10 months to 14 to 15 months. In the real world, that doesn't sound like a lot, but in, when you're dealing with people that are dying and they have a short, uh, short amount to live, the, that was an advance. So historically, like I said, the most important part of this is having a resection greater than 95%. Patients then go on to get radiation in combination with that drug, Timidar. But then also, after they're done with radiation with Timidar, they do Timidar for anywhere from six months to a year. Each cycle is about five days, and then they have about 23 off. And if it would recur, historically, we only had another drug. So we only had two drugs approved for brain tumors. Basically, Timidar and a drug called Avastin, which is used in a lot of other cancers as well. So, how do we get better? How do we do better? Well, most of our patients aren't living very long. And when you're diagnosed with a brain tumor, it produces an enormous amount of anxiety, as you all can imagine. It's not your arm, it's not your liver, it's not your breast. It is you. It is your personality. And then your mental function is changing. And it is absolutely terrifying. And I can tell you from my patients, it's terrifying. So we need to come up with different strategies. So we have all these different ways, different possibilities of tackling different treatment strategies. We can tackle growth factor receptors, different intracellular signaling mo molecules, different maybe kinds of choking off the blood supply to tumors, or maybe vaccines and immunotherapy. So over the years, there's been a lot of different drugs looked at. All of, one, all of them have really not yielded any results as individual drugs. So there's a mutation called EGFRV3, which is a mutation which is prevalent in about 30 to 40 percent of glioblastoma. These other drugs are all inhibitors of EGFRV3, and none of them have really proven to be uh, 
of any benefit. So you can also inhibit other growth factor receptors, uh, PDGFR or other um, other receptors, platelet-derived growth factor. Again, none of these have really borne out to be all that effective, but these are all areas still undergoing research. So um, these also are different areas, different signaling molecules, different signaling cell pathways that have all been looked at. And again, none of them have really produced any tremendous survival benefit. So um, one of the areas that has had promise in the past, which shepherded in the approval of Avastin, was, huh, brain tumors, or not even just brain tumors, all cancers basically, send out signals to the surrounding milieu and say, hey, I'm a tumor, and I need my own blood vessels. I need my own blood supply because I'm hungry, and I need to create my own. So this drug called Avastin was actually an anti-angiogenic uh, drug, and basically it prevents the growth of new small vessels. Um, and it's a good idea. And in other cancers, colon cancer and breast cancer seems to be fairly effective. In brain tumor, it's limited in terms of effectiveness. Overall, it's thought to give patients another four months. So that's not really what we're looking for. So, but there are other um, drugs that are in the pipeline like Avastin that could possibly help with that. So they are, uh, there are, uh, this is Avastin and there's, um, if Fiddlercept and Sidarinib, uh, these all do the same thing, but again, by themselves, th by themselves, hasn't produced the results we're looking for. So recently, uh, a new drug has come on the scene. It's still in the clinical trial phase, but it's VBL111. And basically, this drug targets endothelial cells in the, in the vasculature. And it is shown in clinical trials to improve overall survival pretty significantly. So if you compare um, just VBL by itself, uh, then Avastin alone, there's a benefit of about 235 days. And then if you combine actually Avastin with VBL, you get a significant benefit. So that's a drug that's in the pipeline. It's about to start phase three clinical trials. So, but what is all the rage? All the rage is vaccines. Vaccines and immunotherapy. And most of you have probably heard in the news 60 minutes, about two or three months ago, there was a polio vaccine uh, at Duke that was in the news, um, and there's just lots of other immunotherapies that have been in the news re re uh, recently. So um, a lot of this stuff is predicated on melanoma and other cancers where they've had success in vaccines uh, prior. So what I want to talk about is one of the newer vaccines. Uh, this is called CDX110, and it targets specifically EGFR V3 mutation. So it's about 30 to 40 percent of brain tumors. It's actually shown a fair bit of promise. And its name is Rupendamate, but I, just for my sake, as I just call it CDX110. Um, and it's basically a bunch of peptides that are relevant to EGFR V3 type of glioblastomas. And what they've done is they went to the bottom of the floor of the ocean and found this sea animal. And this sea animal is called a keyhole limpet. A key, a whole limpet is basically just a gigantic sea urchin is what you can think of it as. And they use that to stir up the immune system and then they use this peptide sequence to target the immune system. So in a phase two trial with 65 patients, the overall survival went from 12 to 14 months to 24 months. And that's a significant advance. You've doubled overall survival. The problem with it is that it's only limited to people with that mutation. So, but we're getting specific now. This patient has this kind of mutation, and we can produce a vaccine to target that mutation and produce some results. So, the next vaccine that's just really encouraging is called a dendritic cell vaccine. No, dendritic cells. Um, are a part of your immune system. They're a kind of white blood cell that has been shown that you can prime to target a certain peptide or molecule. So in a phase two trial, um, this, this kind of vaccine um, has demonstrated a tripling overall survival. And the question is, okay, what is it targeting? How does it do that? Well, the reality is, is that it doesn't target a specific mutation that we can put a finger on. What this neurosurgeon does is, Patient comes in the ER, 
No surgery is called, imaging was done, and it says, hey, this patient has a brain tumor. They need surgery. Let's get them in the OR. So we have a clinical trial down, uh, down south, which is up front, follows that, the exact scenario, and the patient is right on the OR. The neurosurgeon goes in and says, okay, I'm gonna take this tissue and I'm gonna send it off to the headquarters. We're gonna chop it up, and then we're gonna send, after the patient is done being in the hospital, we're gonna send them for leukophoresis. We're gonna take off their white blood cells. And those white blood cells are then phoresed, and the, dendri the dendritic cells are sent off to the headquarters. And about eight weeks later, after growing these two things up, you have the patient has their own personalized vaccine. It has shown a tripling of overall survival. So, and, and it makes sense. Hey, what if I use my own tissue, my own brain tumor, to develop my own vaccine? So the dendritic cells may be targeting things we don't understand, but it's still producing results, significant results. This vaccine is now being used uh, down at MD Anderson and uh, across the country in other kinds of tumors and showing similar type of results. So there's more dendritic cell vaccines out there. There's more vaccines out there. There's a vaccine that is based on dendritic cells called IC ICT-107. Um, it is, again, using the patients on dendritic cells, but it's targeting specific antigens manufactured by the company. So the next vaccine, which is also very interesting, is called TOCA 511. And this is not necessarily a vaccine, it's actually a retrovirus. And this is um, basically a method, it's instant immunotherapy, where a gene is inserted into the resection cavity of a patient who's recurred on brain tumor. So this isn't up front, this is after they recurred and a gene for cytosine deaminase is inserted into that tumor cavity. And then it's followed up by a, a drug. So let me show you this video. Or not. Tokagen is developing immuno-oncology treatments for cancer, including high-grade glioma, a type of brain cancer. The company's lead product combines TOCA 511 with TOCA FC. The therapeutic regimen involves two discrete steps with TOCA 511 given first, followed by treatment with TOCA FC. During the first step, the patient receives TOCA 511 by injection. TOCA 511 is a replicating virus that infects actively dividing cells. In normal adult tissue, where most cells are not actively dividing, TOCA 511 replication is further inhibited by the immune system. In contrast, cancer cells are actively dividing and having defective immune responses, providing a safe haven for TOCA 511. TOCA 511 delivers a gene for an enzyme called cytosine deaminase, or CD for short, to cancer cells. As it spreads through the tumor by budding and cell-to-cell -cell contact, TOCA 511 programs cancer cells to make CD. These cancer cells are now primed for the TOCA FC step. Patients then take a pill called TOCA FC. Within infected cancer cells, CD converts TOCA FC into a potent, FDA approved anti cancer drug called 5FU, which kills cancer cells. 5FU also kills MDSCs, which are cells that help tumors avoid the immune system. The immune system is further activated by tumor associated antigens and viral RNA released from dying cancer cells. This approach selectively destroys cancer cells within the body while leaving healthy cells unharmed. Patients take multiple cycles of TOCA FC, repeating the sequence of events which may ultimately result in tumor destruction. Tokagen believes no one should die of cancer. Visit tokagen.com to learn more. All right, so um, both the DCVAX and the Tokogen trials uh, we have down south, um, but there's also a, a lot, probably more than 10 other kinds of vaccines and immunotherapies out, uh, out there. As I talked about, Duke has a polio vaccine only at Duke. It's not yet ready for clinical trials, but it will be shortly. And there's other vaccines uh, as well. 
So for the sake of time, I'm not going to talk about the polio vaccine. And then there's a vaccine in Rochester that is looking at a certain protein called Survivin. Um, there's also a way to put radioactive seeds in the brain tumor. Um, so there's um, a lot of different uh, trials out there for different new therapeutic pro approaches. So when I talk to my patients, I'm like, there is a lot of hope. So recently, three days ago, a device called Optune, which is basically sort of a helmet, that basically emits alternating electrical fields was recently approved for upfront use for glioblastoma. It was approved four years ago for on recurrence, and basically this alternating electrical field in combination with Timidar has shown a, a for real world maybe not a lot, but a four month uh, improvement of overall survival. But yet, who would have thought you can wear something on your head that's alternating electrical fields? and it has an impact on cells. I don't have time as far as the video goes, but you can go to their website and take a look at that. So again, there's um, all sorts of approaches and new uh, strategies for treatment of brain tumors, so it's an extremely exciting time in the brain tumor world. Um, it has been a horrible 40 or 50 years in the neuro-oncology world, and finally we have a lot of promise. So that will end my question. Do we want to go through the question or questions? Okay. All right. So the first question is which of these three, uh, which three molecular markers are important in terms of classifying brain tumors? Do I press anything? Do I press anything? Okay. Uh, most people got it right. Good. All right. So the next question is, so I talked about next generation sequencing, but I didn't give you the exact definition, so I'll give you a hint. B. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody gets this right. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> Somebody's got a sense of humor. <laughs> All right. So the next one is which vaccine listed here is tripled overall survival? I'm not going to give you that. So I didn't get to talk, uh, this was the Optum device, and uh, maybe you all can figure out which the, is the right answer. Maybe didn't address this, but give it a shot. Okay, good. Yeah, all right. 